Good morning, everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to Salt Lake City and the Marriott Library, the University of Utah campus. It's so nice to have you all here. Um, I'm Erin Carraher. This is Jake Gines and Jose Galarza. We're the chairs of this conference. And um, we're excited to kick off the first day. I know some of you had a very uh, action-packed and informative workshop day yesterday. And some went fly fishing in the morning. You've been through, you've been to all of the, the beautiful places in Utah. Um, so we're, we're really happy to have you here. Um, if you have any questions throughout the, the next couple of days, find one of us or Pat Trippany, who's in the orange shirt back there, who is our um, kind of a host here in the, in the library. He is the director of the Center of Teaching and Learning Excellence, which is right across the hall in the faculty center. And he can help you out with um, if you need to print something or if you need to, uh, if you need to get a online access. Um, the UGuest network is available, and there's no login for that. If anybody needs a higher speed internet connection, check with Pat. Um, and you guys have all been through the registration table, so uh, the continuing education credits are being done by day. So today is worth a chunk, tomorrow is worth a chunk. The keynote lecture tomorrow is separate, so make sure that you sign up on all of the appropriate sheets and you'll end up with lots and lots of HSW credits at the end of the, at the, end of the weekend. So that's, that's great for all of us. Um, before I turn things over officially to start with, the, with um, to Franco Tribiano, who's the president of BTS, I just wanted to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Um, we have a print sponsor who's CESNR, um, the, both the Mississippi State University and the University of Utah School of Architecture have been great supporters. Um, the Center of Teaching and Learning Excellence and the Integrated Technology and Architecture Center here at the university are sponsors as well as hosting workshops on Saturday, who um, I think many people are signed up for. AIA Utah and the Young Architects Forum have been, have been very um, generous as well. Um, as Euclid Timber, who, who many of you guys um, met yesterday, uh, all Kip and Steve and all of the great people up there, and not, le not the least of which is AISC, and I believe we have the representative from AISC here. So thank you so much for your generosity. We really appreciate your support. Um, so is there anything that I'm forgetting from you guys? So, um, I yeah. think you mentioned that the boards that have the maps. And all that yeah, so there'll be schedules around all of the different, um, the, the first paper session this morning is in, is, are in kind of uh, different rooms, but all of the sessions Starting this afternoon and all through tomorrow, the paper sessions will be in rooms 1130 and 1150, which are just down the hall to the right. And there will be um, signage outside of them, so you shouldn't have any trouble. Um, and then the, this, this session and, and all of the plenary sessions will be in here. Um, lunch will be across the hall in the faculty center. It'll be available there. You're welcome to take it, and um, there'll be tables set up in there. There's tables out on the plaza, which if you go up to the third level and out, um, there's a there's a beautiful plaza up there, and I promise there's shade because at the beginning, at the middle of the day, it gets a little warm, but it's lovely in the shade. And there's a waterfall. I think it's running today. I'm not sure. Um, and also, Rob Whitehead has uh, is orchestrating um, kind of an informal mentoring lunch. So any of you who have been to BTS conferences in the past know that there's a tradition of newer faculty and, and, and more seasoned faculty getting together at lunch and, and just helping set up some of the mentoring relationships um, across universities and, and helping those of us, I know that I've benefited from it greatly, helping those of us who are younger faculty um, start to connect with people within, within the field of building technology at, at other universities. So it's a great resource. If you have any questions about that, check with Rob, who's right here. Um, and if, uh, if not, just find somebody that you know or don't know and, and talk to them a little bit about your work or ask them about their work. Um, so I mentioned Pat Trippany, the Center of Teaching and Learning Excellence, Ryan Smith, the uh, Integrated Technology and Architecture Center. So they are, um, they are here, most of you know them. They're longtime BTESers. Um, and so I think without further ado, I will introduce Franco Tribiano and um, President of BTS and turn it over to you. So thank you very much for being here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're all here. This is fantastic. My name is Franca Trubiano, and I am the um, acting president of BTS for this year. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the opening uh, of this two day, three day, almost four day actual conference. <laughs> you add them all up um, intersections and adjacencies. Um, 
This is a recurring every two year uh, event that we host as part of our BTS and I think it's become one of our sort of signature activities. Uh, we'll have an opportunity to discuss uh, the future of this kind of activity, uh, maybe uh, probably tomorrow at our business meeting. Um, but this conference is really the chance for us to get together and to discuss the extent to which building technology is important in how we educate future architects. Um, whether we're having conversations in our sessions or whether we're having conversations at lunch, or whether we're having conversations while we're walking uh, back in, uh, uh, and, 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 and forth to the uh, guest house, it's really an opportunity for us to ask more long-term questions about this really important subject. Now, I'm going to be really brief. I'm already, I've already gone off my little thing here, but I'm going to try to be really, really brief. <laughs> That, that, that's, that's the future of the next couple of days. Um, but, I, but I really um, think it's important to um, thank um, everyone who has worked tirelessly to put this together. These gatherings, for any of us who've worked on these uh, kinds of activities, these gatherings take a lot of work, a lot of people, and a lot of dedication and support. And as we've seen, financial support and emotional support and all, that kind of, uh, all sorts of support. So for that, I'm really, really grateful on the part of all of BTES. Um, I'm also grateful to our membership uh, that continues to grow and that is committed to this particular activity. We're particularly appreciative um, uh, to Dean uh, Diaz-Moore for um, having us uh, here, for opening up um, the university to us and for wel welcoming us uh, in this really sort of important time of the year and for making this campus open to us over the next um, three days. Uh, also, we're really fortunate to have um, the uh, School of Architecture, Utah School of Architecture Chair, um, Myra Locker here with us today. Myra, thank you so much. And all the more lucky for um, having with us uh, the Director of the University of, um, sorry, Mississippi State University School of Architecture, Michael Burke, um, as uh, uh, a member of uh, deans and chairs and directors amongst us building technology folk. We're very happy for that. We're often in conversation with ourselves about how we can expand our reach and our scope and uh, introduce the importance of our work uh, to other colleagues uh, in the university and our other colleagues in our departments. How lucky for us to have uh, deans and chairs um, here uh, today to help us do that. Um, I'd also like to thank our membership for uh, responding to the call for papers. The call for papers comes out usually at the end of the year, of the year prior um, to the uh, sort of biannual conference. And I know that it's really hard to get those papers together for that January deadline. Uh, but we're so pleased that we did receive a great number of papers. And also, I'm really grateful to the reviewers, because of course, without the reviewers, there wouldn't be any presenters here today. Uh, the reviewers, I know that Erin um, and her crew put on a really sort of uh, robust process. And I know that it's really hard to get that peer-reviewed paper in uh, because you've got to muster all of your you know, resources and, and energy um, for that sort of yes, uh, you know, nay or yay uh, kind of report back on your work. But when you get that yay, it's really fantastic. So we're really happy that the uh, reviewers uh, you know, sort of make themselves available um, to us for that. But I'd also like to thank, uh, of course, our three co-chairs. Uh, from the you know, minute that we've arrived to today, and I'm sure that the next couple of days, we're going to see an absolutely seamless uh, set of activities that makes our enjoyment of the process uh, all the better. Of course, uh, Jose uh, Galarza, who I just uh, met on the stage earlier. Thank you, Jose. Thank you so much. Jacob Gines, that I had the opportunity to meet last night. Thank you so much, otherwise known as Jake. Uh, and of course, Erin Carraher, who uh, tireless in her um, efforts to connect the work here to um, her activities on the board. Um, so for that, we are uh, eternally grateful. Uh, it's an honor for us to be able to uh, come and play in the sandbox, um, and it's a real honor for us that you've invited us here. It's an incredible amount of work. Thank you so much. Um, to Patrick and to Ryan as well, who have allowed us to reconnect um, our relationship with um, University of Utah and BTES for a number of years. I was reminded by uh, Deborah, uh, Deborah Oakley, that it was in 2005 that uh, her and Ryan schemed uh, to have the 2006 event happen, and it's really nice that 10 years later we should actually be here. Uh, so it's a really kind of beautiful full circle. So in the next couple of days, we're going to be asking, I think, some pressing questions about building technology. I, I, I have a feeling that we all have in our repository of, of, of thoughts and concerns and on our sort of daily teaching or research questions that prod us to 
uh, investigate further why it, it is critically important for architects to more globally understand this relationship of architecture to technology. Um, it's uh, also disconcerting that we often notice that question rarely gets posed within larger curricular questions. I know that that's the case in a number of institutions that I've had you know, the opportunity to engage with. But I think that uh, exceptionally in this group, we take that to be one of our core questions and our core missions. And I'm looking forward to learning from all of you about how it is that we can in some way uh, facilitate many of the transitions that are happening in this relationship between um, architecture and technology. We know that we have many challenges uh, globally and locally uh, in relation to these questions. Um, and I'm really looking forward to a set of fantastic um, conversations. So with that, um, thank you again to all of our hosts and to um, our membership for joining us for yet what's going to be another incredible conference. Thank you so much. And, um, thank you. I, I should always make notes, especially when I'm tired. Um, the couple of quick final housekeeping things. One is that coffee will be available and water will be available throughout both days in the faculty center. So after it moves out of here, you can always find it over there. Um, and I, mailed, I failed to mention our th great thanks for, we had not only chairs, but also an organizing committee um, who is represented by Robert Young from the University of Utah right in front of me, Pat Trippany and Ryan Smith. Emily McGlon um, and Hans Hermann, whose name I'm probably mispronouncing, and um, uh, Jörg Rugemer, who is on sabbatical in Germany. So thank you very much to everyone. I don't think I've missed anybody off of that list. And um, also to our um, student volunteers and the people that work in the centers that are helping us out over the next two days and all of the staff at CTLE. So thank you very much to everyone who has um, put in all of the effort to make this happen. So enough housekeeping. Um, I would like to introduce um, Mimi Locker, the, the chair of the School of Architecture at the University of Utah, to just say a few words and welcome. Thank you, Erin. Good morning, everyone. Um, you've heard my name twice this morning, and I actually do have two names. Myra is my real name, but I am known as Mimi, so feel free to address me as Mimi. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you here. I, am, I was going to say thanks to all the organizers, but now there are so many people involved that I can't remember all the names. But that really impressed me because it's, it's great to see in a group of people who, you know, there are not so many people teaching building technology across the, North, the country in North America. And to know that you all have such a, a strong group and so many of you are involved in these conferences as organizers, as paper reviewers, as panelists, giving papers. And I think that really shows how vibrant your community is. And actually, I'm going to say our community because I do teach building technology as well. I'm kind of a closet technologist. Um, one course every two years. Um, and I can come out, okay. <laughs> That's true, I'm, in my, I'm with my people now, so it's safe. Um, so I wanna welcome you here. I, I wish that we could have had you in our own building, but we're having, a, um, we're having fire sprinklers installed. So it's not a great place to be right now. And this building actually is a wonderful facility. Um, the library, Marriott Library, underwent a seismic retrofit a number of years ago, and they've created incredible spaces here. And it's just a, it's a great building to explore. You'll see lots of different places where students can gather in small groups around a table to talk, or they can sign out a room and write on the glass and do all their calculations. And um, it's really become a, the vibrant center of the university. So please take some time to explore this building while you're here. We have, another, uh, we have a, a number of other interesting buildings on campus. Um, some new ones, the Student Life Center, which is really a gym um, that you passed by if you walked down from the guest house, uh, opened in January. We have the University Museum of Natural History that's um, it's in what we call Re Research Park, which is a little bit separate from main campus, but it's also very much worth a visit. So there are a number of things that I think if you have a chance, and I know you won't have much of a chance because you have quite a full schedule, I welcome you to visit those buildings. Um, as you heard, we do have coffee in Utah, so enjoy it. Um, but remember, too, to drink lots of water. We're at 4,500 feet here. Um, the sun is intense. We're having a bit of a heat wave. Um, it does get hot here, but this is a little bit hotter than usual. And the sun is really intense. So if you're outside, 
um, seek shade, and please do drink lots of water. If you find yourself winded at the top of a staircase, do not be alarmed. That's normal if you come from sea level and you're up at this elevation. So um, you probably are well, just keep drinking water. Um, so I do welcome you and I look forward to the proceedings. Um, and I think it's gonna be an exciting two plus plus days. So enjoy yourselves while you're here and welcome to all of you. Last in our tag team of welcomes, I'm happy to, um, to welcome Michael Burke to, to Salt Lake City, the, the chair or director, I always get those backwards, of the School of Architecture at Mississippi State University. So. Well, for us, the School of Architecture, it's, we were honored that uh, we would be able to join forces with the University of Utah to put this on. We were sincerely honored with that. That's a big deal. And it seemed curious that maybe the two hottest places in the United States <laughs> got together. But this is a dry heat here where, where I come from. It, it is saturated with humidity. So I think that's accidental. Um, thank Jake for making a connection between Mississippi State and University of Utah. Uh, I had all these names that I was going to thank, and Franca and Aaron have done such a wonderful job of already doing that. I'm going to be very, very quick. But Mimi, thank you, School of Architecture, and Keith, where's Keith at? Thank you guys very much for putting this on. I know how much work it takes and the kind of stuff that is required to be able to host something like this. I'm kind of glad that I get to kind of cruise in and take <laughs> advantage of all of that. And lastly, I wanted to thank um, Ryan Smith for the workshop day yesterday and his, uh, his crew. We had two amazing tour guides, Gentry and Talbot, who are also his research assistants. Seeing um, the, uh, the process and the technology that's going on at Euclid and the woodwork and the, um, the cross timber technology, you know, I learned a lot. I was pretty amazed. And I want to make sure that you guys tell Steve Schrader thanks for kind of doing that and then also giving us a tour. And then the icing on the cake was going to see the Girl Scout camp houses. Uh, wow, um, you guys should be really proud of that. The school should be really proud of that. The center and Ryan, that was pretty remarkable. So that's really all I have to say. Again, thank you for letting us be a part of this. Okay, well I'm gonna bring up Jake and we're gonna kick off the, the opening panel which is um, it intended to kind of set the tone for the questions that will be asked over the course of the next two days. Um, it's following up for anyone that was at ACSA in Toronto. It's following up on some conversations that were begun there, but you don't need to have read the, the, the first chapter to, to get, get something out of the second one. And um, I will let you do the introductions. Could you just pass these around? Sure. So I'm going to have Aaron uh, hand out a brief kind of outline. Its, it's intention is really to help spur a conversation. So as she mentioned at ACSA, there, there were several presentations and a lively discussion about this topic of the future of building technology education. And so from the activities that occurred there, I began to glean out some of the questions that were asked and some of the topic areas uh, that were engaged as part of that. Also, the panelists that we've invited today to take part in this, um, many of them have offered up additional uh, topics and questions that they are uh, particularly interested in having a conversation about. And I'm sure each one of you have your own sort of slant and ideas and topics and things that you're interested in. So we're going to allow this, this panel to be a little bit free form. If you find that there's a question or a topic on this sheet that, that rings true to you. Um, as we move through this, I would encourage you to, to bring that up and, and perhaps rephrase the question, um, and we'll see where this goes. So at this, at this time, I would like to invite uh, the panelists to come up here, up front. Uh, hopefully they should all know who they are. Um, Robert Demodi, um, Dana Gooling, Simi Hogue, Keith Diaz-Moore, and Patrick Trippany.
think as, as all of you can see, the, the topics are pretty wide reaching. Every, everything from digital tools to project based um, research to practice based education um, to prototyping in the profession, questions about the integration of design and technology and the kind of, is there a hierarchy there, is there some other things, and obviously some other larger questions uh, involving the institution, um, meaning architecture and, and like-minded fields and the inclusion of building technology and where th that is moving forward. Um, so I, I will sort of see if there's anyone in the audience before I step in to ask a question, if there's anyone who would like to begin a conversation. Actually, hold on, before, before I do that, I would like each of the panelists to maybe take one or two minutes, kind of introduce yourself, and maybe provide a, a kind of background, your, your sort of interests in this topic and, and some of your ideas, and a couple minutes each, and, and then we'll start doing questions. So, Patrick, maybe we'll start with you. You're limiting me to two minutes. <laughs> We'll pull you off with the hook. Off with the off hook. The oh, Jake, you've always been a problem. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm Pat Trippany. I, I, I was part of, I've been part of the BTS for since it was founded, um, and uh, actually was at the original meeting in '96 in Milwaukee, which really wasn't BTS, but we're claiming it. It's sort of <laughs> like claiming Le Corbusier as part of the AIA. It's just uh, what we do. Uh, my interests uh, in, in building technology go back, and, and teaching go back uh, from from 96. I was actually a new faculty member. I hadn't taught my first class when I showed up in Mo Milwaukee, um, and it, it really did sort of change the way I dealt with things because it gave me permission. Do I need to hold this? Ah, great, didn't know. <laughs> it gave me permission uh, at the time to actually uh, do what what it was that I thought needed to be done and changes that needed to be done. I didn't, that it was okay not to teach my, my teacher's class. I could teach my own class and that things needed to change in, in the profession. And I think going from 96 to now, which for those of us who were at 96 was 19 years ago, that's terrifying, um, um, is really, you know, things have changed a lot. And, and so I've moved on. I, I was chair of architecture for a while, so I, I dealt with that. I serve on NAB review committees. I'm, I'm one of the reviewers that goes in. And I also now run a teaching center uh, at the University of Utah. So I, I, I deal with the larger institution of, of making teaching a better place, or a uh, university a better place for teaching, I think is how I'll put that. So that's who I am. Okay. Dana? Oh, oh sure. You. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dana Gulling. Um, I'm this year's president-elect of the BTES. Um, I was not at the 96 meeting, but was at the 2006, and along with uh, four other people whose names start with D, we started the organization committee um, to launch the BTS from there. So I was the sort of acting secretary at the very beginning and um, treasurer setting up the bank account. Um, so that's been my involvement, and, uh, and then Diane Armpriest and I ran the 2009 conference at the University of New Mexico. Um, when I was a faculty there, and I'm now at North Carolina State University. Um, I teach structures courses and construction materials courses, so I bridge both sort of um, major subjects that the BTS does, so this has been a wonderful organization for me and resource for teaching. Um, and I also teach design studio, and for me, the interest in building technology is that connection not only for building technology's sake, but how does it go back to design, and how can students make that bridge to the design aspect of our profession as well, and use technology as a way of generating, refining, bettering the design. Did you want to take one, or do you want oh, to take that one? Keep your own. <laughs> is that working? Yeah, yeah. All right, good. Um, I am Keith Diaz-Moore, and I'm Dean here at the College of Architecture and Planning at the University of Utah. And let me say welcome as well. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, in terms of um, my interest in this, and I think, I think my purpose on the, uh, on the panel is really to, to do the scary thought of trying to take you inside a dean's mind. Um, so, so come inside my psychosis for a bit. And, and uh, essentially what I'd like to throw out there are maybe two concepts for you to be thinking about, or what a dean might be thinking about. Um, 
One, I would say, is simply the idea of systems thinking or, or, or networks, and I'll talk about where I think that goes in a second. And then second, the idea of inclusivity, which are not mutually exclusive by any means. So in terms of thinking about kind of the system, the system in which a dean is operating um, is, is you know, shaped by the mission of the larger university, and, and most of ours will share some commonalities. So certainly we'll be focused on student success or learning outcomes in some way. Certainly we'll be talking about knowledge generation in our, uh, in our universities. So how, how does what you do place, uh, place a role in, in both of those, and that's probably commonplace. What perhaps may not be as much is um, community engagement, which might be like health and quality of life type of outcomes, and how do you begin to think about how things might get measured there. Two I think are really important to be thinking about. Um, one is long-term viability of your universities. Uh, quite simply, the way our architecture programs are typically funded is we rely a lot, if you're in a state institution, we rely a lot on our state funding or, or student-centered funding, state funds, tuition, fees, so forth. Um, that's a shrinking bucket. I mean, that, that, that's not the good place to be in terms, of, in terms of diversity. So one of the things a dean needs to be thinking about is how what we do not only improves learning outcomes, which is what state legislatures tend to think they're funding, um, but also, you know, how it might be improving things in, in practice that might lead to sponsored research projects, things of this sort. Other buckets, the grants, the gifts, sponsored research, are, are important aspects. And then the last one I think is particularly important, and I think one I would really encourage you as, as um, in, in this organization in BT, um, to take a look at is, is diversity. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is, it's critically important, I think, as, as we take a look at our universities, the, the stream of students that we will be getting will be different than the ones that we went to school with in all sorts of different ways, whether we're talking about diversity in terms of ethnicity, in, in, terms, of, in terms of socioeconomic status, in terms of experiences that they've had. Um, I would also talk about in terms of mental health profiles. And so, uh, you know, I, uh, we had a staggering statistic presented to us that about one in 68 students will, will come somewhere on the autistic spe spectrum in short order to the university. Um, that raises a whole kind of set of issues for us, particularly as we talk about um, what might be the entry points for students into our BT sequences, um, the way that we teach it. You know, uh, we certainly are seeing more and more collaboration, but when you start thinking about uh, students that might be on the autistic spectrum, that may not work. And what are the ways of differentiating learning within your classes to allow them the chance for success, I think is gonna be a really important issue to wrestle with over the next uh, decade. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for coming. My name is Bob Dermody, although my, uh, my name tag says Robert. Please call me Bob. Um, thrilled to be here and on the panel today. Uh, I teach at Roger Williams University in Bristol, Rhode Island, uh, and where we hosted the 2013 uh, BTS conference. And I was also at uh, Milwaukee in 96. Uh, Patrick and uh, Shaheen and I like to brag about that, but that's where I met them. Um, and I think one of the things that I've gotten out of this organization is the, the not just the collegiality, but the, the scholarship of collegiality and, and meeting people who are as passionate as I am about what we do and what we're trying to do. And as, as I was reflecting on this uh, panel this morning, uh, sort of the topics that we're reading about and coming out of the, and this, by the way, on our uh, website, I believe there's available the uh, dialogue that was leading into this today's discussion from the ACSA me meeting held just recently in Toronto. So sort of a continuation of that, and I was reviewing that. And just reflecting back on the, the 10 plus years or, or approximately of BTES, and we're still talking about this. We're, we're going to be talking about this for a long time, but that's a good thing. Uh, what is building technology education? Uh, and if you look back for our, our first meeting that Deborah and Ryan hosted at Maryland in 2006, there were two very strong tracks, structures and construction. Uh, we had about 75 people there, and it was, it was a lot of eye-opening. I was like, wow, this is the people I've been looking for for a long time. These are my people. And, and that's still true. But what's interesting now since then is we see lots of new faces at every conference, which is wonderful. Um, but the topics we're talking about have broadened. Uh, it's not just structures and construction. We sort of started there. But I think that's a reflection of what's going on in techn technological education in schools of architecture. So it used to be, oh, that's what you teach. And, and someone mentioned the other courses. So we're trying to be more inclusive uh, and have other faculty join us and talk about what they teach and how they teach. 
uh, and I look forward to hearing more about that in this panel and throughout the weekend. Okay, thank you for that introduction. I'm gonna step over here and steal one of these wireless microphones and walk out here and uh, let's begin the conversation. Is there anyone brave enough to pose the first question to our panel? All right, so curriculums are pretty full. We don't have a lot of room in the curriculum and we don't have a lot of room to add new things. And so one of the challenges I've, I've found through the years is trying to make the most of the little amount of time that we have with the students, right? And that while we are at a conference of building technology educators, there's other people who also think that what they're teaching is the thing that needs more time, more energy, more effort, and more of the students' uh, time. So one thing I remember Ed Allen talking about many, many years ago was in fact that challenge of everything being quite full, and so how do we either, either make the most of our time, or do we push to actually have more time and more attention? Wide open. I'll start this one. Um, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I think we, I think we always wanna find where the new places are in the curriculum that, that we need to be part of filling. And I think one of the examples I'll put is, is the whole idea of, of the use of computers in construction, which is a brand new topic. I mean, you know, okay, granted, some of us were dabbling in it 25 years ago, but, but really it made its way into, in the last five to 10 years into the curriculum. And I think that 25 years ago, that, that was owned more by the people who were the computer geeks, uh, as opposed to the building technologists. Um, and you know, those that, that spent their life writing code in, in dark rooms and by themselves, as opposed to those of us who were in dark rooms by ourselves playing with structures. Um, but you know, I think one of the examples is, is that we have to always be looking for the place where we need to help fill the gap I think that's my point, is, is that the number of people around this table that are new and have new ideas that we weren't covering back in Milwaukee or, certainly or even in, in Maryland um, are those who really are dealing with this idea of computers and building and how that, that's fundamentally changing the way building happens and fundamentally changing the way we design and work. Um, and, and, and I think that's one of the more exciting places that I see this group going is towards that. In terms of, 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 of finding, being more efficient about what we do, I, you know, I, I run into that all the time at the teaching center. There isn't a curriculum out there that has too much, you know, extra room. I mean, I don't care whether you're talking at the English department or the architecture or nursing or, they all, you know, the first thing they all say is, is we have no room for anything new. So, but we have all these needs. And, and I think part of that is, is redefining what it is we're teaching and redefining what is the important thing that you're teaching and, and, and in terms of structures, which is what I teach, I mean, I think that there's a lot of what my predecessor taught that I do not teach and there's a lot that I teach that my predecessor did not. And that's largely because my definition of what was truly important uh, was different than his de definition. And I think we each have to make those definitions and whether we call them learning objectives or what we call them um, is really up to us. Uh, but uh, that's one of the things that Ed Allen sort of has left with us is, is you have to make the decision of what's important in, in the area you're teaching. And just because two people are teaching the same thing, it doesn't matter, or same topic, it doesn't mean we're teaching the same thing. I'd like to jump in and add uh, some more broader terms, uh, context and value. So uh, uh, working with our students and engaging them to understand the context of what we teach, not just in the classroom and as they go to their next class or they go to studio, but when they start getting internships and where that's going to fit, where that knowledge is going to fit, and the importance of it. it in my impression, the, the buildings are only getting more complicated for a variety of uh, forces and reasons. And I think we have to engage our students to understand that they will bring value to firms with all their skill sets that they have and that we will uh, teach them and, and share with them. Uh, so I think that's uh, incredibly important. 
uh, is to share with them, no matter the topic, um, structures or life systems or uh, environmental systems, that where it fits in the scheme of things. Um, and unfortunately, we, we teach in, in courses, and that's how we organize curriculums. We have numbers, we have boxes, but that's not how buildings get built or how you work in a firm. Um, so there's a bit of a struggle with that, right? With students that like, okay, now I go to structures, so I put my structures hat on, or now I go over to the acoustics class. And I think it's a, an incumbent upon us as faculty to, and years ago it was like, yeah, we're the, you know, we're getting picked on. Well, we have a place in this. We have a big, important place in this. We need to reach out to the faculty who are not in the room today here, our colleagues who are back at home or on sabbatical, et cetera, to say, well, this is what I'm teaching, and even if you're not teaching in sync or in collaboration, but know what they're teaching. And also to talk about it. I, mean, I ask my students all the time about what they're doing in their other classes and try to connect it. Uh, sometimes more successful than others, certainly, or sometimes more literal than others. Um, so that's, that's what I would, I would say. And Dana. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting question to me because I think, especially in the building technology area, all of us are sort of required, or I imagine that all of us are required to teach some of the required courses that our students are taking, right? So we're embedded in the curriculum, and there's a, there are learning objectives that we have to go through, and there are opportunities, and we have to teach them certain skill sets. And there are different ways in teaching it, but that's there. And I don't know that there's a lot of opportunity in that area, in the required curriculum to start teaching or broadening and expressing some of this. I think in some ways, for my mind, it's starting to tease the students that, it's a, that it is a broad subject, and I'm teaching you a small segment of it, but there's a lot of stuff going out there. And I would encourage it from a different way, which is the opportunities to start offering seminar classes and elective classes for students who are interested in technology but want the depth there. And to actually, the potential to free up our curriculum, to give that opportunity, and this allows the historicists, the, um, those that teach theory, which are also important subjects to architecture, to also get their foot in the door. Because I think in some ways, architecture now is probably the broadest that the profession has ever been in. We are no longer, that is in terms of diversity, not only in terms of the student population that's coming through, the profession is getting much more diverse. Um, in terms of the people that we're seeing going through the profession. But there's a lot of room in architecture. You can be a design-only architect. You can be a spec writer. You can go into the sort of bridge um, between perhaps the manufacturing side and the design side. You can start going into construction management. Design build firms are now out there and available. So there's actually a broad range in the profession, and I think starting to give our students the opportunity to see that that broad range is there and to perhaps find their own path. Because building technology, I would argue, is not necessarily for everybody. It's important that everybody understands the principles behind it, but those that are really invested in it, that really want to think that it's important, that they also have the opportunity to get that depth where they need it. Um, I guess a thought for me on this is, um, I think one of the things, particularly when we talk about curricula, uh, it strikes me in the places I've been, is we don't really get fine-grained enough when we think about the issue of time. And so we buy too readily into the notion that a studio is five or six credits and it meets 10 or 12 hours a week and it does it on this way. And that, uh, that our, our whatever, let's say our structures course, you know, oh, it's a three-credit class and it has to be, uh, be done this way, and, and we just buy into it too much. What, what are, I think to backwards engineer the curriculum as much as we might want to do classes is, is also appropriate. So begin to say, um, you know, perhaps there are modules, if you will, um, uh, that might be able to be taught in, you know, 10 weeks, maybe five weeks, right, if we're in 16-week semesters. I mean, one of the things that launches that thought to me um, is, you know, I've had the chance to like visit the University of Oregon, which is on quarters, which introduces a certain amount of flexibility within the quarters more than in the, in the semester uh, approach, just simply the way it's, it's offered. It raises some other issues, but, but in terms of kind of that flexibility, it's, it's interesting what they do. So they'll, they'll have a semester that doesn't have a studio in it, uh, or a quarter, I should say. You know, they just drop it out because they need to cover some other things. It offers up possibilities, is what it does, when you get a little bit more fine-grained. 
Um, and, and so I, I think that's a possibility. I think another one, and this is, would be university-wide, um, uh, it's not, certainly not just within our departments, um, is, is the whole notion that, that we're holding on, m most of us, to a notion of, of nine months is the appropriate time to be in school. Are there appropriate times to be asking them to be doing things in summer? Certainly some programs do professional internships. We've thought about it um, in architecture programs that I have. Certainly a lot of us do introductory s summers, right? So all of a sudden we've broken the rule already once. Um, why, why aren't we doing it in other ways? What, what's the flexibility that we can really buy into? And we shouldn't be hesitant in doing that because certainly in the, every, every campus I've been on, the law schools had a different schedule. Why do they get to do that and we don't, right? So, so we, we, if, if our education demands that, we need to be the design thinkers that we are and really think about, okay, what rules do we really have to abide by and how can we break that? I think that's really important in this time of thinking about diversity. Thank you. Next question. Um, this is building, I think, a little bit on, on some of the things that you were just talking about, but um, one of the things that I appreciate so much about this group is that it's, um, it's, it's as much about how we teach as it is what we teach. You know, the, I think pedagogy, you'll, you'll see that the, the largest number of tracks are on the subject of pedagogy and building technology. So um, I, I wonder, you know, you often hear, and you guys kind of touched on it a little bit, the, the discrepancy or the, the kind of um, conflicting interests of studio with classes that are not studio based and I just wonder if you know part of the part of the kind of um, proposition of this conference is that there, that things are starting to become more integrated and that there are certain adjacencies that are starting to develop that are allowing for I don't know if it's about it's I don't know if it's necessarily making space within the curriculum um, but it's it's in some way trying to make a little bit more of an integrated approach to the curriculum um, through different strategies, and I think we'll hear several different people speak about pedagogical um, structures that they're that they're including. And I know I've learned a lot from these conferences in the past. So I guess the question to the panel is: Do you see um, do you see it becoming a little bit less siloed? Is it is it not really that way to begin with? Do you see the kind of curriculum moving into a more of an integrated approach and and introducing more of the building technology into the design studio or a crossing over with history and theory or something like that. All right. I'll take a shot at this. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, I think things can, uh, are and are happening uh, in a more integrated fashion in uh, some ways. Um, so for instance, um, uh, you know, uh, at least when I was uh, undergrad at Illinois, it was incredibly segmented in terms of heaven forbid the structures professor step foot in the studio. I mean, you know, so, so that was my education. Now we have them, uh, you know, actively involved. Some, some will get st studio teaching assignments, um, things of this sort, which, which is happening in programs r uh, around. Um, some are partnering classes together, so studio together with um, a theory course uh, that goes together. Our design build bluff does that, for instance. Um, so, uh, so there are things like that happening. I th I, I, I would come back to this notion of time. I think there are even additional ways to further that. I mean, if we, if we really think about it, I mean, w one of the discussions when I was chair at Kansas that kept coming up was this idea of, well, we want the classes that are taught at the same time to be integrated into the studio somehow. Um, and inevitably, the studio professors were like, well, you're not getting to the content I want until the end, and I need it in week four, and you're giving it to them in week 12, right, or whatever. Um, and the idea is, well, Part of that is because we're buying into the assumption of, uh, of how things are timed out. I mean, I if what we need is certain content within a studio, how would we put it up front? I mean, does that studio have to start on week one? Could we have three weeks where, okay, we're gonna focus on this content so you can manage it within the next part. And then all of a sudden you have to have faculty begin to talk about what, what, what's happening there. I think the more dialogue, as you've pointed out, is really important, but I also think questioning assumptions about the way we're structured is, is critical to, to innovation. Um, it's interesting because we've started having some of these discussions at state and part of the thing is is that some of it's been a transition um, the faculty at state at North Carolina State University has really been in a transition from a practitioner um, I will go ahead and say older white male guard 
um, very design oriented with some idea of how buildings go together, but really a sort of mid-century modernist kind of idea, um, to a much more broad-based um, curriculum. Our curriculum is still the same in its structure, but we've started hiring faculty who can do other things. So our environmental controls faculty is not a mechanical engineer, but is actually an architect. Um, the structures and the structures uh, person teaches design studios. The material and methods person um, also teaches studios. And I have found even in the course, I think of um, my time in academia, where in the past 10 years, we're starting to see the integration of the technology courses with somebody who can actually teach it from a design standpoint, not just from the silo of the technology standpoint. And I think the beginning of that is really starting to make those connections back to design, and it's no longer just running through the numbers or my experience for structures or doing your um, calculations for your air exchanges, but really understanding what the impact is of those courses onto the design standpoint, which to me is, I think, really an important thing. But that's really also just coming from not teaching it the way that we've taught it. We haven't necessarily had the opportunity to start co-teaching our courses in that way. The one concern that I have, and what we still run up to with our faculty, is a time issue. Because the, doing a lot of the things that Keith is talking about, I love the idea. It's very time heavy, and I think certainly about the setup at uh, Iowa State, where you guys are all teaching overloads to teach a sort of rotating 10-week schedule. And one of the things that we're also seeing in academia um, is the burden on technology faculty to start bringing in the grants that those in the history theory area or the practitioner area are not. And so we have, we've hired two specific research faculty who come on, their teaching load is half, but they're expected to get the grants um, to sort of help balance out the faculty. That also creates a burden because that those teaching intensive things that you want to teach and educate architects can't be met with the time constraint that we as faculty are now bumping up against. So that's one of our concerns. I think one of the things that, that we, we, I mean, the idea of integrating with design is, or integrating us with design, or technology with design is, is, is a topic that we have always covered around here. And one of the things that's been, that's come out most years when we've been having this conversation is, is that we always, we can't just think of, of them integrating us with them. Mm -hmm. We have to think about us integrating. So when I teach structures, I can't not talk about design. I have to talk about design because it's an important part. I'm not, I'm not training structural engineers. Um, matter of fact, if any of them try to be one, I, I tell them I'm gonna go slap them upside the head. Uh, you know, that's that I d I'm not giving them those tools, but I am giving them the tools to be an architect. So you, mm -hmm. have to, you have to talk about architecture in every class, and you gotta talk about design in every class. Um, integration amongst faculty is always difficult uh, because it's personality driven. Um, and, and nobody has bigger personalities than faculty. Um, that comes from a chair perspective. Um, and uh, you know, even if you get it to work to begin with, continuing to get it to work is very difficult. And so, you know, Aaron and I might be able to collaborate quite nicely uh, because we like each other and we've got some similar personalities. But then Aaron goes on sabbatical and, uh, and I'm stuck with somebody I can't work. And, and that's always really problematic. I think at the bottom line, if we're really going to start to think about this integration and, and integration being an important part of the curriculum, we do have to be brave and eventually throw out the curricula we have today. Uh, the model we have today is not sustainable in, in terms of that integration. So if integration is the most important part of the architecture of the future, which I think it might be, I think we have to come up with a different paradigm. I don't think this paradigm is going to make it. Uh, I'll add, unless there's somebody burning to get in here. Um, uh, I appreciate the question, uh, Aaron. I think it's incredibly critical. Um, and I've been uh, trying this for a variety of years and attending reviews at other schools. And, and, and I would advocate we keep trying this. Um, it's uh, at integration with a capital I or small I, but trying it at different scales among different courses, 
among different technical courses in studio. Um, I believe we'd ha we've had sessions teaching technology as design, so this idea of embracing the studio model, even though in a three-hour course of giving design assignments in structures classes as opposed to problem sets, basic things like that. But I think it brings me back to my earlier thoughts about empowering the students and engaging the students to, in a way of thinking that, you know, it's not that and that, it's, it's all together. And it, it, it's messy, absolutely, and Patrick is absolutely correct with the, the personality issues, and that's what's like on job teams in the real world. So I think that's something that we still need to advocate for, and that's also something, this is a perfect topic that this group can take on. So people will be here this weekend, and then you can network with someone, and you can say, all right, what are you doing at your school? How are you integrating? Are you integrating at the comprehensive level, or at the thesis level, or in an undergraduate studio? Uh, a few years ago at uh, Albuquerque, when Dana hosted, I uh, presented a paper on linking an undergraduate studio and a construction materials and assemblies course. Uh, and naturally, the, the, the Patrick Charles, my colleague and I, who taught the construction materials and assembly and also taught a section of studio, so we had a foot in both camps, but then there were seven sections of studio, so there were five sections that were not in both camps, and that created friction. And then the students in the sections knew that as well. So, but we forged ahead. I mean, we, we sort of you know, forced the integration in that case or, or tried it. We're not doing it any longer for, for a variety of reasons, uh, but that does not um, discourage me. Um, so I, I advocate that we as a group, as faculty, continue to find ways to do this. It's incredibly imperative. Uh, I think we hear it from employers who hire our students, uh, the ability to work collaboratively uh, in a variety of, of settings and environments with different skill sets. Uh, you're not going to do a completely integrated design, perhaps in a three-hour course, in a nine-hour studio, et cetera, over 15 weeks, but it's immersing the students. It's uh, sort of you know jumping in in the middle uh, a little bit sometimes. Jake, you want to? Yeah. Uh, I just want to add uh, some other thought to the mix that is the idea of online courses. Uh, I know that our university is going to 50 is going to be 50 percent online courses by in five years, and we have s about 60,000 students now. It's Florida International University. It's huge, and it's going to be even huge, more huge. So, as like people who te teach structures and technology, uh, what are we like? How should we rethink this? That actually has some innovation in it. So we're just not throwing the same courses online, is there any, like, how do we think about this? How can we be creative about actually enhancing the way we are teaching? Because this is coming and there's no stopping it. I, I think everybody knows, probably the dean knows the best, <laughs> that this is coming down and there's no stopping it. Well, here at the University of Utah, we've got a big push going currently to, to take programs online, to not just courses, but whole programs online. Architecture is not doing it currently, um, and I don't know whether we will or won't. Uh, eventually, that's not my decision, thank God. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, but it is my my job at the teaching center to, to work very very closely with faculty who who have who have decided that they're taking their classes and their their programs online. And one of the biggest thing that I found is is before you can really do that. You really have to step back and, and go back to what is the what fundamentally are you trying to teach, because you can't just take your your face to face course and put it online. It doesn't work because I, I I mean I look out to this group. This group is full of personalities. I guess I'm overemphasizing that a little bit, but but what the student really pays for when they come to your class is you, not the curriculum, but you. Now you introduce the curriculum. You you work with the curriculum. And, but if you just took and put your online, your face-to-face -face courses online, um, we, we see a huge failure rate at that. Um, because you have to figure out ways, understand first off what it is you're trying to do, what are your learning objectives is the term we would use in, in teaching pedagogy talk. Um, and how are, you, how are you going to evaluate that and then ultimately how are you going to deliver that information? And what are you gonna, what kind of activities are you expecting your student to do? Some of that stuff is going to be similar, like the didactic part of teaching structures is, is not going to change a lot. When it, if, I'm, 
if I'm just talking about, you know, how do you construct a bending moment diagram, I don't know that it matters whether I'm doing it in front of a class or whether I'm doing it in a 15 minute video. Um, but the idea of the student doesn't know how to do it when I finish that. And, and it takes a lot of interaction between me and that student, between the student and other students, and the student in just having practice and exercise and that sort of thing. And so that part of it is what changes in online learning. Um, and at a successful online class includes a community of learners, just like a face-to-face -face class is. And I think incorrectly we always assumed that an online class didn't have a community of learners. They just had individual learners who, who happened to pop into the same course. But you really need that community to go, and, and it's gonna take a lot of work to get there. And I know there are online architecture courses today. Um, Lawrence Tech, uh, I've got trying to think who the others are. There are three or four that, yeah, BSE. Uh, there, are th there are three or four that are there today. There are gonna be another dozen in the next five years, I would guess. And I would guess before most of you are done, your, your school may actually offer an online, fully online program in architecture. Uh, but it can't be what it was for us when we went to school because that just model just won't work. Okay, um, I wanna step back just a little bit if we can, because a couple of things, um, Pat and Dana, that you said I'm really interested in. Um, I'm actually a structural engineer teaching in an architecture program and been teaching nine years and I've changed a lot over the nine years. I came in and, you know, like you said, your predecessor and what they taught and then you taught things differently and I've certainly changed a lot of things and um, I've come much more design-minded just sitting through, uh, I remember my first, uh, you know, studio review. I'm sitting there going, <laughs> you know, what is going on, and I, but I've learned a lot about architecture through that and, um, and how to look at things not just from a structural engineer standpoint but from a design standpoint. But um, I guess it's difficult for me to word my question, but how, you know, what things are important to teach in structures classes so that they, are, what design concepts, you know, where, where is there room for calculations? Are the calculations important? Or uh, I know I've, I've really uh, toned down on the calculations and tried to beef up the conceptual topics more. Um, but that's one of the main reasons I wanted to be involved in this conference and come here is to learn from all of you. And maybe this is, you know, partly for some conversations later. Um, you know, but where is the balance? You know, what are the important topics? You know, and how do I, as a structural engineer, who am very interested in teaching the best way for the creative mind, you know, what, what are those important topics in the structures curriculum? I think part of the question is how much time do you have to teach it? So I, I have the luxury of still having three semesters of required structures. That luxury means I'm teaching three semesters of required structures a year. Uh, but, but nonetheless, I have that. Uh, but not everybody has that luxury. I, I think the, the minimum uh, number of required structures courses uh, that, that it still has an NAAB uh, accreditation is one semester. And if you're teaching one semester, I think you throw every equation out the, the window. I, I, I don't think that there is any equation, I don't think any equation, in my personal opinion, rise, rises to the level of being important if you only have them for 15 weeks. Um, now when I teach them 45 weeks, we do a lot of equations. Um, we do a ton of equations. I mean, you know, my students would tell you that, that you know, they know how to do bending moment diagrams. They know how to figure out the Euler buckling load of a column. They know how to, uh, a moment of inertia, determine, I mean, there are a lot of things there because I think the equations support uh, the concepts mm -hmm. and so if I've got the luxury of getting past just delivering the concept to them I, I have to I have to have the equations in there because without the equations I think they they do, the level of grasp is is too too minor in my opinion mm -hmm. so I think that there's a line there but but it also is a question of where you're where you're coming from and what kind of luxury of time you have I completely agree 
And it's hard because like, I like the math. I mean, I'm an architect and my undergraduate education, I have a concentration in structural engineering. And the thing that helps me with the math is that it reinforces the concept. It's hard for me to memorize a concept personally. And I, I think all of us sort of teach from the position that we're at. But if we see the math start working out, we say, oh yeah, the concept has thus been proved and we sort of start understanding it from that aspect. But for my mind, it's a lot of the students will do the math if they know why they are doing the math. If you're just doing the math to do the math, they don't care. But if you start showing them examples of buildings where it starts becoming important, and the thing that I have found, not only, and I don't teach, I mean, I teach a hybrid course of intro to structures and materials, but I find now that I find really good examples, very pertinent examples in terms of things that have been built in the past 10 years of examples of architecture, and then we start going into the details of it. And if they start seeing a really good building that they really like and they want to emulate, that that becomes the bar in which they're trying to reach. And then they start going, okay, now I know why I'm doing this um, and why we're going through this. And I'll even tell them we're going through the math to understand the concept. Um, and I don't necessarily take them. I've introduced bending moment diagrams and things like that. But to me, it's at the end of the day to know what the, di the diagram's not for the diagram's sake, but no. to go back and start understanding that this tells you where your maximum bending stress is. Maybe you redesign the beam. Look at this project with an interesting beam design that has taken the bending stress diagram and has started, started impacting the actual aesthetics and bringing it back full circle for them in terms of the aesthetics. And if you do that, the, they're a little more likely to go along with the math. And I know, Eleni, coming from a art school, you are really at a different, a different place than other programs that have. Um, but our students have no physics coming into our program. And so, yes, the math is, it causes anxiety for a lot of them. And that's hard to overcome. But if you couch it in a reason as to why they're doing it, that helps. Uh, this is a subject near and dear to my heart as well. I teach structures. Um, uh, we've been talking about this since 1996, and I have come to the realization we will be always be talking about this, but that's okay. Uh, I want to talk about it. Um, no great structure started with an equation. No, none of the great structural engineers of the world, goes to Weiffel's Tower, or Maurice Cochlin is his designer. The, the first day on the job, they didn't do WL squared over eight or whatever. Pick an equation. You don't even teach them that one, Pat. Um, <laughs> I don't teach them that equation. <laughs> All right. Um, but no, it's, it, and this uh, trying to get onto what Dana was saying, the inspiration part of the showing them the great structures and why they look the way they do and, and getting the students to acknowledge why it is a great structure or building and what excites them about it. And that yes, it, you can lead it to that. And um, uh, all right, I got to tell him that Alan story. Uh, we're at BTS. So <laughs> years ago, I went to have lunch with him and He's the, in his very ed way, started asking me questions. How do you design a building, Bob? Uh, and he's taking notes over there by his salad. And, uh, and I still have that list somewhere. Um, and it's uh, this idea of you know, how you design a structure. And we came up with about nine or 10 steps. And it wasn't until eight, nine, or 10 that numbers appeared. It was, you know, what's the program? What's the architecture? What's the vision? What's the site? What's the idea? What's the material? Uh, all of those kinds of things. Um, so I had mentioned earlier, and so the point of that is that yes, you know, structures will always need calculations eventually, but where is that eventually? And then maybe that relates to what Patrick was saying about is it in a one semester or you have three semesters? Uh, if I can go on just a little more, uh, Marcy, Deborah, and I have been talking about this for a while as well, and we're embarking on a, on a paper project to, to look at structures courses specifically because Patrick mentioned that you can satisfy a, the one NAB criteria for structures with one course or five courses. Uh, that's amazing. <laughs> Think about that. That's one, you know. So all these different schools are doing it, you know, de facto incredibly differently. And here's an organization where you can find out a lot about that from who's doing it how uh, in different settings with different students at, at different levels. And someone had asked me when I mentioned that, or, or what your prerequisites, and that's a whole other sub-discussion of do you have physics when you come in? Do you have calculus or not? Mm -hmm. um, do you take the courses in the engineering school uh, or in the architecture program? Are they taught by architecture faculty or structural engineering faculty, et cetera? Um, but the good thing having for us uh, structures uh, people is that you always need structure. So um, that's hopefully they won't take that away from us. <laughs> Uh, 
I teach in an art school. Um, we have four structures courses, um, and we don't do boneless chicken. Uh, all of our buildings <laughs> must have bones. All of our uh, design professors must require structural models of their buildings. Mm. And so, you know, years ago, 43 years ago, when I started the program, uh, we required in every design course that students build the land, contour by contour, excavate the land, put in a foundation, stick mm. by stick, put in the structure, and then hang some kind of a skin or suggestion of a skin on it so that they understood it was, a, it was an analog for the building process. And they were working back and forth between the model and the drawing. And they'd see something in the model that didn't work and they'd change the drawing and, and back and forth. And so we didn't mind when we did reviews if, if the models weren't finished or the drawings weren't finished or if they even didn't quite correspond. But we were looking at the growth of the process of connecting the 3D to the 2D. And that was the most important thing for us. And so uh, for us, we've seen that we've witnessed this change uh, as the computers have been uh, introduced. And now the students want, uh, in many cases, and are required to know Revit in, in order to get a job. Um, and so now they're trying to, to, to fulfill the requirement of structural model on the computer. If, if you're using Revit, it will sometimes supply things that you didn't design. Um, and it looks more finished than it actually is. Um, and so the students are, are not really thinking about the skin of the building in, in a really detailed way because it's just appeared. Uh, and so we're worried about the kind of thing that, that computers have done to the actual physical model making process which is so important uh, for them. You know, we have a school full of makers, and that, that's a very good thing for them to do, to, to go at structure from the making process and to understand the difference between volumetric and spatial. And so we don't want volumetric. We want them to understand space by space how, how, it, how it flows through the structure. And so the latest problem we've been having is they're using these, uh, exotic computer controlled cutting machines to make structural parts. And this tends to cause them to do extrusions because they'll make a set of, of, of these parts and they'll go marching along and they'll think they've done it. Well, they haven't done it because they haven't thought about it really. It's not 2D reproduced, it, it's got to be 3D. Mm -hmm. And so I'm interested in your response to this sort of issue and how you're dealing with it. Well, I, you know, when it comes to some of this stuff, I'm, I'm pretty low tech, I gotta admit. I, I, when it comes to teaching technology, I've, I've stayed on top of it. When it comes to BIM technology, I, I, I am not on top of it. Um, I, my, my BIM knowledge is 25 years old at this point, and it wasn't called BIM in those days. Uh, but, um, you know, I think part of it is, is that it's always this connecting it back to what the student is interested in. And that's, that's architecture and making sure that it's always there. So the example I'll give is I, 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 my, the third semester at Utah is a semester that they can choose what they take in the structures field. And it's, it's actually taught by many people. I teach the summer and other people teach the fall and the spring. But, but there's choices that they can make. And, and this summer I'm teaching a high rise, which is teaching in four weeks. So I'm teaching how to do high rise steel structures in four weeks. Yeah, um, uh, so obviously I am not getting to numbers. I mean, that, that you know, uh, but the first week of the four weeks is actually spent in the design world. And I do it up front. I mean, traditionally you would have them do the design after you've taught them everything they, know, they should know about the topic before they design. And, and that's the way I learned how to do it if, if, if design ever made it into structures. And, and I want them to make every mistake in the world. I, I really do. So we do design, we talk about design, we have design critiques in that first week, um, and then we get into doing things like computer modeling. Uh, but again, it's what are we, I, I try to emphasize why we're doing computer modeling, 
And again, it's not to size the structure. In the end, the, the big joy with the student gets is, is when they get all of the, the lateral loads in their model, which are not correct, uh, onto a structure that's not correct, uh, and get to watch their, their building actually doing a hula dance on the screen. I, the, the, the look on their face to understand lateral loads finally. Now, granted, that building's now deflecting 50 some feet at the top, uh, which we all know is not considered good. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, it, they understand it and they understand the need for, for a lateral load system to deal with it. So I, I use the computer technology, but I don't use it as the end all or be all. It's a lesson to get to something else. And, and in this case, it's a lesson to get to lateral loads and high rises. Okay, uh, we're, we're, we're running short on time, so we have one question. We're going to let Billy, but Billy wanted her former student to ask this question. So you get <laughs> Thanks, Billy. Um, it, it, I guess my question is, it's more based, uh, it's less a question. It's something for us to think about that I think Rob started, and I know um, uh, Keith mentioned. If we're really to think about integrating you know, technology with the curriculum, I think it's something we can't just look at in a semester. I think it's something we need to start looking at throughout the entire academic, their entire academic career. One of the things that, I don't have any colleagues here, do I? <laughs> Good, okay. Um, yeah, it is starting to think, I think some of the things you're starting to think about is you can't directly, you know, it's really hard to just directly integrate it with, with studio. And so one of the things that we, I am starting to think about is how can we start to think about how we have projects or something where the, it, the things that they're learning is, is almost like a, something they can keep in their tool belt. They, they can come out and it starts early. It starts in, or a project begins to sort of get teased out early in the technology series and it continues to build iteratively through the entire curriculum, through second year and through fourth year. So it's not a single project. And I think, you know, and that's sort, of the, that's sort of the mindset that I'm trying to hopefully push into, into the technology sequence, into the curriculum, is not to look at it. I think Bobby mentioned the same thing. You, structures you don't have to, to do in one class. That's a tough sell, though. It really is. And so how can you sort of subvert it in a way that you're doing it and you're not realizing it? If you can get a little bit of, if you can get colleagues you know, you focus on this and you focus on this and you focus on this, can you start to take one concept or one um, project, and that's what I'm starting to do, that they slowly start to build as a series of experiments and that ultimately end, they kick out at the end and something that you have no idea what it's gonna be, but hopefully they've achieved a, a series of learning objectives in terms of understanding foundations with building construction or structural frames. You can start to look at it with building envelope. You can start looking at it with detailing and how they actually do an entirely integrated project, not a, not a, you know, a continuous one, but one that sort of moves and morphs based on the uh, sort of different series of experiments based on the technology faculty. step up to that one a little bit. I mean, it goes back to the idea of re redesigning the curriculum and, and trying to figure that out. And, and in, in pedagogy talk, we ca call this just-in-time teaching, um, meaning that you decide that when the student needs, and, and I guess it would be around the studio, though I think it's a re-envisioned studio, not the studio we have today. And th that decision would be that, that at this point in, the cur in their five-year curriculum, a student will need to know uh, the technology of a rain screen. Need to, or we will be applying the technology of a rain screen at this point. So the question is, is, is when do they need to have that? They need to have that before that day. Um, so you're teaching that, and maybe in a three-week segment, just before you get there. And so, I mean, it's it's breaking apart the curriculum. And one thing about online learning that I think will change. Is, is the idea of a three credit class is gonna go right out the window with an online learning. It's going to be a series of modules and those modules are gonna be much shorter um, and they're going to be very directed and, and you will learn how to do a rain screen and then you will learn how to apply a rain screen. Um, at least in the programs that are doing well, that's what you're applying. 
So I think this just-in-time teaching's got to be part of it. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and and uh, the uh, to stay on schedule, we're gonna we're gonna move uh, forward with this. But I'd, I would like to personally thank the panelists for your. Um, insights and perspective on this and for the questions that were asked and I'm sure there were many other questions that we just didn't have the time to ask but hopefully our effort with this is to begin a conversation that will continue in formal and informal ways throughout the course of the next three days and so you know if there are pressing questions come grab these folks and and uh, have those discussions among amongst yourselves as well some really interesting things I think that we can pull from what we have talked about in terms of the future of kind of online deliver and delivery of these kinds of things, the integration of all across our curriculums and what that means moving forward and various pedagogical approaches that we're gonna hear much more of moving forward. So thank you, Pat, Dana, Bob, thank you very much.